so the first question um, is, I guess, general concerning your position. Uh, why do you think uh, people have to act morally? And how did your position evolve on this question? Like, did you change the mind? Uh, over uh, yes. yes. Uh, so uh, my position certainly has changed. I think my answer to that question now would be uh, because it's the most, uh, if you follow reason, then you, there are reasons why we ought to try to do the most good we can. Now, I didn't always think that. I, I guess, was more of a person who thought that uh, it's a matter of our preferences, of our judgment, that you can't really produce rational arguments for why people should or, or should not act, but uh, rather that you could encourage people to be nice people and to be benevolent and so on. Um, but uh, sort of over the last, uh, I guess, 10 years or so, partly through the influence of Derek Parfit uh, and partly through going back and studying Henry Sidgwick, the 19th century utilitarian, I became persuaded that, in fact, you could argue that there is, there is reason on the side of um, thinking from the point of view of the universe, as Sidgwick puts it, right? Not that the universe has a point of view, but that we can we have the capacity to take the point of view of the universe and to say, so what would I think is the right thing to do if I were not just one person among all these people, but I was looking at it from the perspective of taking everybody's interest into account. Now I think that you can argue that there are, that's the most rational approach to the question of what ought we to do. And whose interests should we uh, uh, take into consideration in our moral judgments uh, I mean, what kind of species should we take into consideration? And do, and also, do persons have persons have any special privilege in that way? Okay, so the answer to the first part of the question is we should take account of all beings who are conscious, right? And by that, I I use the description of uh, beings uh, for whom there's something that it's like to be that being, right? Okay, so, Nagel's. Yes, kind of. exactly, right. Is there something special about being a person? Well, um, when I was um, a preference utilitarian, I argued that only a certain kind of being can have preferences for the future because you have to understand that you are an entity that has a past and a possible future. And then you can form preferences for the future, which I argued were uh, provided an important reason for not taking someone's life against their will because they have a preference to go on living. So on that, you know, on that view, understanding the account of a person as a self-aware being, aware of itself as the same thing over time, uh, it was important to be a person. I'm now more inclined to uh, hedonistic utilitarianism rather than preference utilitarianism. So on a hedonistic view, uh, that distinction is only indirectly important. It's, it's not that it's lost all of its importance, but uh, the importance comes rather from the fact that some beings you know, who are persons may get to know about other beings like them being killed and then they may be fearful about being killed. It's, it's a kind of the consequences that is relevant rather than directly taking the preferences into account. Mm -hmm. But why do you believe that Utilitarianism is the most defensible ethical view. What is its main advantage in comparison to other theories? Well, I think its, its main advantage is that it is a kind of a, it builds on something that's quite commonsensical that we all appreciate. Uh, you know, we try to avoid suffering. We try to find happiness in our own life. We care about the happiness of others who are, we're close to. So I think we all recognize happiness as a good and suffering as a, a bad. And utilitarianism says, uh, so okay, I'll take this as a starting point at least. Convince me that there is something else to ethics. And then the other part of why I think utilitarianism is the right view is that I don't find any of these other arguments for absolute moral rules or for uh, absolute rights um, as persuasive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's clear, for me at least, that you try not just to describe an, an ethical reality, uh, but to transform it. 
Uh, and could you briefly describe a kind of ideal of human relationship? Uh, so, an ideal of human relationship would yes. be one in which we uh, cared for each other and uh, tried to uh, harmonize our interests to the greatest possible extent so that we uh, were concerned for the interests of, of all sentient beings, not only other human beings, um, and including future human beings. So not only those at present, but those who will exist. And is it, is it a real possibility, how do you think, to achieve uh, this goal? Uh, look, it depends maybe how far you project into the future. Um, I don't think it's possible with human nature as it exists now, but um, we may learn how to modify human nature uh, if you go far enough into the future, and then it may be possible. Mm -hmm. And the last question of, our, mm -hmm, of this brief interview. It seems that you favor practical and, or applied ethics over theoretical one. Do you believe that meta-ethics uh, could be useful as well? And if yes, in which way? Okay, uh, so firstly, yes, I, I do favor the applied or practical ethics over theoretical and meta-ethics. Perhaps because I feel I personally have more to contribute that it's been a relatively neglected area of philosophy and there are other very brilliant philosophers working in meta-ethics and uh, theoretical normative ethics as well. But I certainly think that meta-ethics and uh, normative theoretical ethics have things to contribute. And um, the book that I co-authored with Katarzyna de Lazari Ruddick, uh, The Point of View of the Universe, you read that? Right, okay. So that includes meta-ethics as well as normative uh, and applied ethics. Thank you. Well, I have uh, two hypothetical scenarios. Okay. So I'd like to get your expert opinion on what to do. So imagine you could create any kind of world. Say it's a simulation on a computer with conscious artificial agents inside that simulation. And in fact, you have created the world just like ours. So you could create any kind of world, but you created the one that is just exactly like ours. Would you be responsible for all that suffering in the simulation world? Uh, did you know in advance exactly? Yeah. All, yes, then the answer is yes. So can you just expand on that? So you're. So well, it's, you, you, everybody you, you, has free will in that world, or at least no, but, adds, but, as but, a but I've, I've chosen, as the creator of this simulation, to give everybody free will, knowing that giving everybody free will will lead to the atrocities and crimes that we have witnessed throughout human history and the cruelties that we inflict on non-human animals as well. Um, and I don't think it, you know, this is now me speaking, yes. my personal judgment would be that it was not worth giving people free will if you knew that they were going to do those things with it. Right, and what would be the worst, the, the, the most... So you think our world is not the optimal in terms of minimizing suffering? There are uh, easier isn't that ways. obvious? Yeah, okay, know, well... It's totally obvious to well, me. Well, not, I don't know, not to every philosopher that's obvious. Maybe some, some philosophers think that this is the, uh, the best of all the possible worlds. So one of the reasons that I'm an atheist is that I think that this is the perfect argument against, against the existence the, of an <laughs> omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent creator, right? And the second, okay, so let's imagine, so you started the simulation with the civilization, and that civilization is going the way that it's going to destroy itself. Well, perhaps uh, this, you know, global warming or maybe, a, you know, third world war or something that's going to happen and you can... Uh, see that in the world that you've created is, is con going to destroy itself. Do you have, if you see it, a moral obligation, and of course this, this world is populated with 7.5 billion conscious artificial agents. So do you have a moral obligation to save the lives of these artificial agents if it involves risking your life? I think the answer to that is yes. Can you explain why? Because you, you've created so much happiness, you've created okay, so but much it's, good but it, stuff. But it's, but it's, so firstly, I have to say, despite all the atrocities that we talked about and all the suffering we inflict on animals, 
I do think that this world as a whole is positive and to the extent that it's not positive, I tend to be optimistic that it, if, it, if we survive, we will become more positive. So okay. in the simulation, obviously, the same thing applies. So if I allow all of these 7.6 billion people to be killed, then not only is whatever positive value there is in the world now lost, but the possibility of a much better world in future is also lost. And the right thing to do in those circumstances would be to sacrifice my own life to prevent that happening. But you kind of created the whole thing, so you've already paid the dues and no? No. And you are kind of like the primary like source of all that good that... Okay, but I have said it in process, yeah, right? Yeah. And uh, I can't take that back now. I, may, I might then regret ever having said it in pro process, right? If I'm enough of an egoist, I might say, oh, I wish I hadn't done it because now I have this obligation to sacrifice myself. And I could have just gone on and had a fun life by myself. But still, having created it, uh, I think I have to leave it to work itself out. And the last question, do you actually think that there's a chance that our world is actually a simulation? Uh, I don't think of this as a realistic, you know, everyday thing that I need to think about. But if somebody <laughs> presents me with an argument... I like Nick Bostrom. You, yeah, I know the Bostrom yes. argument, yeah. yeah. So, a possibility, yes. There is a possibility. I don't really agree How that it's... How probable it is. Exactly, it is. and Bostrom himself is not too <laughs> clear no, no. about that. He just but, likes uh, to... Yeah, but yes, it's a possibility. You're analytic philosophers, but you're not specialized in ethics either of no. you, is that right? Well, well so maybe... Uh, you're, you're more no, so? No, no, no. But uh, of course I've read... Uh, you obviously uh, have uh, read, read, I can uh, see that. Derek, yes. Derek Parfit books on what matters, it's absolutely brilliant, I agree with you. Ah, good, very good. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. So are there analytic philosophers who are specialized in ethics, who work in applied ethics even in, in Russia? Maybe, maybe. No, I don't, think not, so. I don't know. Uh, anybody who is uh, specialized okay. in this area okay. and who works in analytic traditions. Right. Of course, we have many... Uh, so, because so, I, I was talking to somebody just the other, uh, about the possibility of uh, getting a tr Russian translation of practical ethics. Do uh, you think there would be a market for that in, in universities, if, if that happened? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have actually translated uh, a lot of books. Uh, we've, uh, we took, uh, not in ethics, but uh, we took uh, Sweet Dreams by Dan Dennett. All right. Uh, we translated uh, Dave David Chalmers. Uh, Vadim was actually was the translator of ah, David right. Chalmers' so We translate books and they, are, they sold very good. Okay, that's encouraging. Good. So, so there would be a market. Yeah. You think that your practical ethic is best to translate uh, first? Well, Maybe I, I your was shortest says uh, published just two it, years ago. It, but it, it's in English. It's in Russian now. In in Ethics really? in the Real World. Yeah, I saw a oh, copy I today. I read it in, in, in okay, English. Okay, you could now read it. I, oh. I think it was just published in the last uh, couple of weeks. Oh, great. Or maybe a month or so, yeah. Great. Um, and Animal Liberation will also, I, I know mm. it's around it's on the there. internet, but it will be published uh, also by, by Sinbad, mm -hmm. who have published um, the uh, Ethics in the Real World. Um, mm. So those three, and then somebody asked me, well, what else would you like to have published next after those three? Mm -hmm. And I thought, Maybe practical ethics Maybe. It's, would be the uh, of best course. after that. I, I agree yeah. that it's a good choice. Okay, thank you. Good.